We'll see McGorkle in the interview. One take one. Hi, Lucy. Hi. How has your experience been here in Kosovo? It's been great. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever experienced a festival that focuses so much on the people that actually live here and how engaged they are with the whole festival. Fully hands-on and experiencing, you know, asking questions and actually benefiting from it. What were your sort of your thoughts coming in here because I called you up like a month ago said hey Lucy you want to come paint in Kosovo uh, did you have much of an, an idea of what that experience might be like what the Balkans might be like I don't know if you've painted in this region before no, I haven't I didn't really know what to expect um, I mean you hear growing up you hear all of the all the news but no, I had no preconceptions really. Because it's funny because there's like a couple of different age brackets here on the festival and for our sort of anyone 30 and over, the name Kosovo is automatically synonymous with the, the war in the late 90s and that conflict. Did you expect it to be kind of the way that it is? I, I didn't expect it to be so... Like, kind of actually seems to be a lot more, not affluence, but people seem to be dressing up, sm- like there's all, I don't even know how you say it, but Valencia shoes, what's that? Oh, Balenciaga? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lot of aspiration, which I guess the young people are at that point now, whereas I was still expecting there to be a knock on. The younger people seem definitely moving forward. Didn't expect to see Tony Blair Street. Didn't expect to see Bill Clinton in a traditional hat. Bill Clinton Stadium around the corner. Yeah, someone told me that. It's quite jarring, isn't it? Because you kind of get here and you, we're so obviously used to the West being associated with Iraq and Afghanistan, which were kind of like international failures. Yeah. And here it's just weird, you know, sort of being from the West, further West, and them actually really fully embracing it and being so you know, warmly received to the intervention that was done here. Yeah. When you're coming into a space like this, does it change how you engage with it or how you feel about your work and the place that it's about to exist in? I was chatting to someone I met in the airport and he said, everyone in Kosovo are very strong people, which you'd expect. Um, And I just kept thinking about that when I was painting the mural because normally I'll trying to do more kind of subtle and but there's definitely this energy that's all around you and everyone's so friend like everyone just kept stopping and saying slow down slow down it's summer the days are long don't you know but friendly everyone's friendly here that's that's funny that they were telling you to slow down because you were kind of like at, at the time when you came you were the last one here and you were finished your first wall within yeah, but I had, did have the smallest wall and no lift issues. So it's much more playful then because you don't have to work up. Well, you can. But for me, I never really try and work. It's not as watching everyone else work. It's been really interesting the way they're fully researching and documenting and then working off the images they've gathered. Whereas when you've got a small wall, you can just have to play. And so, how do you approach a wall then? Like, what's your thought process? Because you don't, you certainly didn't, you know, send over sketches before you arrived or anything like that. No, and um, yeah, I, because I often certain elements will dictate where you can reach and what you can do. But they, I had two people helping me, Albert and Erland, and they were incredible. They were great, but they. They were wanting to learn and join in, so then we were painting a lot together, which changed what I would have done, possibly, because I didn't want to just come here and be kind of this focus now, you know. I wanted to, if they were up for helping, then we kind of worked together on it. So it becomes more of an exchange and you want to kind of like pass on that, that 
process that you know the whether it's technical or conceptual or how you're approaching or attacking a wall yeah and i always feel guilty if someone's just stood around watching so if they can pass the time i actually getting stuck in it is funny here particularly because you see how how many of these young artivists as they're known are now just kind of going off and painting their own walls and this is something that just wouldn't have been it just didn't exist here you know before mural fest totally I I got shown around the art school earlier in the standard of artwork was so high. What role then does murals or do murals and public art play in an area like this? What function do you think it serves? I guess it is, there's a basic kind of autonomy it can give someone if they can go and paint and achieve something for themselves. It's empowering, isn't it, for them? What do you want people to take away from the space that you've kind of cultivated there? The, the little wussy corners that you've carved out? I don't know, because... Again, this is where I kind of differ. It's been interesting working with all... Well, being here with all the other artists, because I approach it all so differently. And for me, it's actually more the time spending in who's around me rather than this finished thing so for you it's more about the i guess the journey than the finished product you brought in color does that uh you know there's quite a strong red in there how does that kind of play in because i know a lot of your work traditionally has been very monochromatic and then when i saw that red it felt intentional and it felt strong exactly that was the the force of the people kind of yeah is that pre-planned or is that something that you responded to no so i responded to uh, but then I felt, yeah. How long have you been doing this in the street? Over 20 years, 20 years, something like I that. I know, someone stopped and said, looked at the elbow helping me and said, you two look alike, but you could be her mother. And I was like, hey, yeah, I could be. Actually, you're not, you're not wrong there. How does that make you feel then? Do you feel like a, a sort of an elder of the scene now? No, because I feel kind of removed from it. Um kind of step in and out. What is your relationship then with the term street art? Do you, is it one that you ever adopted or embraced? And how do you think that might have changed now? Because you, you've, you've certainly been woven into the fabric of it, particularly if you look at the UK's history. And, you know, it's, but it, it, it is, like you say, it's kind of like in and out. Oh, Lucy McLachlan, okay. I, like I would never use that term. For myself even in the earlier days yeah what was your feelings towards it then why what why didn't it sit with you a lot of people i was around painting with it you know they were so focused on only that but street art i don't know it just felt oh, i don't know it's kind of like the equivalent to hoover and a vacuum cleaner to me do you see what i'm saying no, 100% go on. <laughs> I don't want to be negative about it, but then to me, the street art term isn't... It kind of got... I feel it kind of got swept in and taken in a, in a certain way that... Well, I certainly wasn't doing it for those reasons. Do you mean it, that the kind of like... It just became homogenised and it could be someone that's approaching it with a really fine art kind of traditional approach and there's no difference between that or someone painting Mickey Mouse with a ghetto blaster or yeah it kind of became uh, I don't know maybe I'm only talking about certain aspects where I don't know people do it for different reasons don't they what was your reason for doing it then just to have some fun just to see things and yeah. What was your... It was never like, okay, I'm going to get the biggest wall, I'm going to be, you know? Yeah. What was your your first your first time doing something in the street? What was it? Was it letters or was it the more abstract forms that we know today? It was more figurative, really. Yeah, just like messing around in car parks with friends and taking a brush down. I developed like bad RSI, so then I was just... Maybe this is, um, like I look back now and I think I was much freer in my work. So we did a, 
my first show that I did, I painted the entire upstairs. I had canvases, kind of traditional setup. And then downstairs, I'd painted the entire walls and ceiling. And then it was based on a speech impediment I was talking about. Um, pieces of paper on the wall. So then they were pulled out and reframed. So these were like the disjointed abstra abstractions of how I would speak. And just maybe like four years ago, the Bowman Museum and Art Gallery acquired the work that was left from that show. And then they wanted to exhibit it last year. And so it's made me look back at my early work. This is going back from like 2007. And at that point, I didn't think, I don't know, I, I was enjoying myself, but I didn't necessarily think the work was any good. But now looking back, I realise how much more, like, just freer I was with it. So I need to go back into that headspace. I think I'm at a turning point now. So what what happened? Was it the just the fact that we're all freer in our 20s? Yeah, probably, and I didn't overthink things. Yeah. And now time's so short that back I'm without that space to actually continue, like readdress the situation. It's almost like you go on automatic, don't you, to mm -hmm. get through things. Has that changed your relationship with what the work means to you and how you feel about the act of creation because if you are just doing it for a laugh and you think oh, i'm going to do something else or whatever you're not really caring about your legacy or you know the, the our own mortality and things like that um has that yeah changed how you feel about actually the process of making stuff and what it might mean it has um and i've been particularly ill recently so I was at a point where energy is limited so you know really having to pick and choose what I was gonna put that into and I, yeah I think it's I'm gonna have to pause again I know I should point out just I know I'll keep this in is I know that there was a reluctance for you to do this and you just kind of casually referenced a speech impediment and I know that the idea of doing interviews is in the most comfortable space for you and I think this is kind of true for quite a lot of artists it's like well why should I have to talk my work is doing the talking for me if I you know that's my language right there and um and I know that for a lot of artists it's like this part of this job is not the part that makes people feel most comfortable it's like you know writing grants or applications or something like that. it's like no i don't i don't you know i don't write them i i make work because i don't do that stuff um do you feel that the work that you made in the street is an extension of maybe the things that you've what you want to say not necessarily what i want to say but definitely um like i'd rather sit and sit back and let everyone else be the kind of do all the talking. And that's it's funny because with street art particularly, it was very common at the start where the artists were all anonymous and we didn't really know too much about them. And then there was over the years that kind of that shift that suddenly brought everyone out into the forefront and the the kind of the monikers had gone and everyone kind of paints under their real name and Yeah, well you see I never have had a moniker. I always remember thinking, I should have, like, get why, especially my surname, no one can spell it, no one can say it. How do we say it? <laughs> you need to say it. Oh, you say it. McLaughlin. Uh, there we go. Yeah, McLaughlin. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I remember my uh, Scottish grandmother, great-grandmother, oh, I was young, an old lady basically bearing down on me, saying, you can't say your surname properly. Was she quite an intimidating woman? Where was she from? Uh, Killing. To where? Near, near outside Edinburgh. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, so it's East Coast. Yeah. Oh. Okay, my West Coast. <laughs> right, that's it. That's the end of the. <laughs> that's the end of the interview. No, actually, it's no, it's not. It's just north of Glasgow. Okay, all right. Yeah, because we drove. Because <laughs> <laughs> we ended up driving up there and broke down like four times and found McLaughlin Castle, along with all the other McLaughlins from all around the world that had donated to a bridge. 
uh, all American. Yeah, all American. Yeah, were... But none of them was spelled the same way that um, mine is. Even my name, uh, Gillen, has been changed. Um, my grand told me this. She was like, it, usually it would be G I L L A N. Ours is E N. She's like, yeah. I think there was a fight in the family at some point, and they just changed the A to an E to to sort of piss someone off. <laughs> I think that's pretty much how it seems to work with most of them. That's the Celts for you. What do you remember about those sort of those earlier days and the the culture that was bubbling? Did it seem like it was something that was about to become a global phenomenon? No, but like looking back, I do feel having now worked with institutions and more kind of formal settings, I didn't appreciate just how like good it was at that point where if you wanted to do something people would just feel like yeah we can make that happen whereas other areas you just get a no no and it's a paperwork and battle to get through Mm -hmm. um so there's definitely you know from that perspective and i guess because everyone was young so this kind of what did it feel like hey this part of this practice will be an extension of my career or where my career will it will help or was it completely disconnected from that? Yeah, disconnected. To be honest, I didn't... Yeah, I should have learned to play chess when I was younger, but I'm, I'd never kind of had this structural, like, okay, this is where I want to get to, this is... Mm-hmm. All of that kind of happened without me kind of plotting my like I think now people coming into it it's all laid out and you can see how you can make this work yeah it's a career now whereas I never thought I could I wouldn't have expected to still be surviving off and doing it now at all how much does the street public part play in your practice now then because like you sort of said you know it is something that's maybe not you know it's not every single festival that you're at or every month you're doing another project they're quite select you're quite selective with what you're doing isn't it yeah i am i am i've always been kind of careful with like especially when like the commissions were coming along of what i was going to be associated with or who um and as i say with energy is i'm selective because you know, it's, it's so physical clamping up and down the scaffold um so it's not so much these days. Uh, I've been doing like a lot more like exhibition work and kind of installations, studio based. Do you get uh, the same kind of satisfaction out of doing the studio stuff, exhibition stuff, um, compared to, you know, that feeling of finishing a wall like you just did, you know, a couple of hours ago? Do I've always appreciated being like in situ and having, seeing what happens and not have, you know, things can take turns and you're meeting people and they're chatting and within the studio, it's so solitary. I mean, I like my own company. I can sit by myself, so. You know, I remember when the pandemic came in and everyone was like, oh, we're being locked in. We've got no, you know, no communication. And the artists were like, well, this is the exact same as my life anyway. Like, nothing has changed here. <laughs> oh, you mean I'm going to have to spend eight hours in the studio on my own? It was the same. I was just going to studio and home, studio home. It's like even, but coming out after that, you know, as things start to go back to normal, it still feels like there's something that's kind of, I don't know. It feels like there's something that's ultimately changed, and there's a, a sense of maybe freedom there that I don't think we'll get back for a long time. Yeah, but I think it's made people readjust their, um, like their quality of life for some. Mm-hmm. So close friends who were up at five and doing the, you know, commute and then having these days working from home, they feel like they've got a life back again. Yeah, it's like, mm, why the fuck would I do that? Yeah, I think there was definitely like a big wake up in that sense where people really did start to value their time in a new way and they realised that, hang on, this is a fucking trap. Yeah, hang on. <laughs> Oh, I had a choice. <laughs> With regards to your studio practice then and, and exhibitions, how do you think your relationship with institutions and museums where you now seem to sit, how has that altered the way that you look at yourself and your practice? 
because it's like I was I, I asked this because I was watching a thing yesterday where it was a uh, it was I think it was Jamie Foxx talking about as, after he won the Oscar and he immediately gave the Oscar away because he said if I have this thing it's going to change the way that I act and how I am because I'm suddenly validated in this way and I'm now believing that I am this person and I wonder if when you begin to work with museums and things in such high esteemed positions uh, if that alters the way that you think about yourself. No, because my confidence in imposter syndrome is far too high to ever. <laughs> Do you have imposter syndrome after 20 plus years? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't believe that. Yeah, that doesn't, I, I've, my mindset doesn't ever, like I'd never kind of consider it in that way. You'd never looked at the Jamie Foxx video of him giving away his Oscar and said, oh, hang on, that's, I relate to that in this way. I saw a, a Snoop Dogg uh, doing a speech and he was like, first of all, I want to thank myself for all the hard work I've done over these years. And then I'd like to thank myself for just sticking with it. And I was like, yeah, this is true. Everyone else is out there thanking God. What the fuck did God do for you, actually? In your own, like, hard work and yeah, yeah. perseverance. You're like, God didn't make you work hard and put you in those positions. You did that. Oh, let me first ask, what do you think was the, if you had to find one or identify one, what was the biggest turning point for you in your, in your legacy? I mean, maybe I, I do need to thank Angelo Studio Cuomo here because he reached out to me in an email years ago and said, do you want to come to Italy? Food's really good, we're gonna, my mum's really good vegetarian cook. And, and being part of that from the beginning and then watching all the artists he was inviting and seeing how their careers were all flourishing. I think that that was a turning point somewhere in there where it turned from me just doing this with my friends to suddenly the people that I was kind of hanging around with then. When was this? Um, You're on the spot with dates now. Oh yeah, do you know my... Was this before or after Santa's ghetto? I don't know, somewhere around that time, wasn't it? Do you remember much of that one? Because that was like a turning point for the culture. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's funny because I'd been doing stuff with them for a while. I, You know when you're kind of up close and you don't really see it? And then maybe it was only from going and then meeting people from other parts of the world and then seeing it with fresh eyes. Yeah. Yeah, because when was that, like... Uh, 2005, 2006? But but when you look at, particularly when you look at Santa's Ghetto, it's like the, the list of artists that are now really, you know... And then you see people like Anthony Mikolev in there who are just so institutional and never really had anything to do with the street but was assimilated into that culture. And it's funny because when you looked at that lineup, you know, the, when you look at that compared to how street art is perceived now, it almost possibly felt more contemporary and fine art and gallery ready than a lot of what we would see in street art shows now. Yeah, it's true. What is it for you then that kind of attracts you to a project? You can say money if you want. No, I was going to say someone told me that it's always the, it has to be one of the four Fs, at, le at least two or something. Okay. Friend, make any friends, fun, fame or fortune. So which two was this? <laughs> this one. Yeah. Friends, definitely. And fun. I'm sorry that we've not been able to give you fame and fortune from it. <laughs> but I was very clear in the initial email. This will not make you rich in any way. There is no money in this project at all. This is one that is done purely for experience and because you believe in what you do. I think if you're upfront about these things, then, then it's up to other people. You know, that's some of the festivals, That's it's just about the fame and fortune. Yeah. And those are the ones that I tend to steer away from. Because you can tell it a mile away. Yeah. How many sort of street projects do you do? How many international ones are you doing at the moment? Because I know that over the years you've been pretty much everywhere. Are you still focused on that travel aspect? Uh, not so much. So um, 
there's a few kind of collaborations I want to do with people closer. I think I'm. That's what's interesting me at the moment. So, it, I worked with a young dancer called uh, Nina Grinley, and she she was responding to my work and doing an interpretive kind of dance. There's something about like if I just draw a emotion and then she will transfer that into her body because when I paint I feel it's quite like like I have to hold by it's not just your arm you know you have to physically be steady and use every kind of muscle so I always thought that dance would probably be something quite because there's a performance that comes within your work inherently well not the performance side but the actual physicalities of it which for a spectator is a performance yeah it's not it's not an intentional performance you're not you're not doing it for the the drama of it, but there's something that's inherently pleasurable to watch. Yeah. Maybe what, watching pain try? Well, I mean, that's literally my job. <laughs> it's, it's, that's all I do all day, every day, is watch other people's pain try. I watch artists paint constantly, and I, I find it interesting, even here, in fact, here especially, because we've got a, quite a broad range of artists and how they approach, and... I really enjoyed watching the way that you approach a wall because there's the there's the, the the initial step back and then there's the hand that moves as you're calculating the spaces and where everything's going and then there's the sort of like holding the brush and then the practice strokes that come with it to just nail that circle like how does this circle look and then it's that kind of like that's it okay there's my preparation done and then in comes the the actual the movement because you get one shot at it, right? Yeah. So Matt Watkins, who I work with a lot, and he films a lot of the process. We were in New Zealand and to do an installation in this gallery. And so I just, we'd made all these like homemade brushes to get them really big. And you, you do have to like kind of prepare like, okay, how's this going to, because you've got to get the pressure of the brush. It's like screen printing. You've got to get the, the right pressure and you're trying to like, when the brush is this big, you've got to balance it or make sure you've got more there or here. And then you've got to watch where your feet are going. So if I'm trying to like go up, I was building a little paint pot to a chair, to a ladder so I can keep stepping. But without falling over, so you have to practice this like motion a few times to be able to nail it and do it. So there's inherently a dance within your practice. And so the film he made, because it was this whole space, it does have more... Someone someone said it looked like a workout video because I'm like moving all around but that's why I'm particularly interested in the way Nina moves because she there's a, such a similar fluidity to it so when you're standing at that wall and you're looking at it and I assume it's similar maybe with a canvas I don't know if there's more sort of pre-sketching gone into a canvas or if they're the same same when you're standing back and I can see the cogs turning in your head and the hands push, pinpointing positions, what is it that's kind of going through your head at that moment? Just trying to find that balance. So it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle. That's how I kind of, so I'll make one mark and then I've got to figure out how to, where the next manoeuvre is going. And just making sure there's some flow and balance to it. Which is why I think using black and white, I enjoy the... How do you not overcook a wall then? That I used to overcook a lot. I think that came from a lack of confidence where I was like, oh, I need to keep. Really? And, but then there's that simplicity where you've got to know that point, otherwise you have ruined it. So what's that point for you? Uh, when I start hating it. As <laughs> soon as that turning point goes, you're like, okay, I really need to step the fuck back from there. What is it that you get during that time? Like, where are you in your head? When you're when you're doing this, are you thinking in a technical way? Or are you thinking? Well, I think the only thing I could think that's closest to it is I started doing ceramics, and it's just that, just a presence, isn't it? Nothing else. So you like doing that one wall you can block out everything, and then just become one with it. <laughs> so without being as cheesy as that. Sorry, I'm gonna. I'm going to hate myself for saying that. <laughs> no, I wanted to actually ask you, um, because you mentioned it, the RSI, 
how how has that uh, in, impacted you know being an artist it's been for a long time and you, you, I just rather than me trying to describe what that is can you tell us what RSI actually is and how it Im- impacts the well, body well it was carpal tunnel that I got and like it it's just a constant pain so I couldn't use my right hand at all for like seven months or something got quite good in my left hand um it came back recently, like a couple of months ago. And so I immediately went to see this acupuncturist. That's the only thing that seems to like help calm it down. Like I tried everything. It makes movement hard, it wakes you up through the night, it's just a constant mm-hmm. it's where you've just like aggravated the nerves. Mm-hmm. Uh, so acupuncture was the thing. That it's funny, my mum my mum now swears about acupuncture. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, so I had it, when I had it really bad, it was um, like 15 years ago or something. And that was the only thing. And did that ever play into, you know, hey, look, I'm doing, I'm craft here. I need my hands. Yeah. And well, it was, it was actually kind of a blessing in disguise because I think that was that point when I was overworking things and I was, so it lifted me out of using my wrist and, and using my arm more. So, you know, silver lining. Is that why your canvases tend to be quite large? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've just been um, making these um, for the South Bank Centre. I've been commissioned to do an installation running around that opens next week. And so I've been using fabric instead of painting because this was when it was flaring up again. So I thought, well, I can't paint them all. So I was just cutting out fabric and then playing with that and stitching them together which again if I hadn't had this aggravated then I would have been I wouldn't have gone down this new process and I've really enjoyed the new process Have you started showing these? No they we install them tomorrow so they'll be it's part of their their Haywood Gallery their like Planet Summer thing that's going to be on throughout the whole summer Okay amazing so this will be the first time that we get a chance to see it Yeah What always interests me is the textures that you're able to create within your work. Yeah. I was interested watching the wall particularly, that, or the two walls that you were painting here, and I wanted to know how that effect is achieved, because it's not necessarily just the texture of the wall that's inherently there. This is... Easy, I know it is, really. Is, it, is that... But there's more to it than that, because it's definitely got your hand in it, because... Well, yeah, I mean, there's the pressure, like as I was saying, with the, with the printing, yeah. I think... I'm trying to really, I don't want this to come out the wrong way. <laughs> if, if someone looked at your work, they, they could sit and like sketch that out and try to recreate it. But I think it would be really hard for somebody to recreate it the way that you do it. Like I can't look at someone paint like a figurative, detailed, hyper-realistic portrait and say, oh, I'm going to do that. But maybe with sort of simpler shapes, it's easier to recreate. Oh, yeah. Is this something? No, this goes back to what we, the conversation we had the other day where... It, at least it, it not at least I mean it's a good thing bec- okay let's start again go <laughs> <laughs> like that we're pulling it all back <laughs> um the like a lot of schools use like my artwork to get kids to free up a bit because a lot of them are trying to do these photorealistic drawings and it's not everyone's hand and eye you know whereas in my work it is much more approachable but yeah, it's interesting because I get sent loads of photos of their version or people that have had tattoos of the work. And yeah, there's the, you know, you can recognise it. The shape is there. But it's just that, like I keep, like I was saying to the guys helping me, it's, it really is the pressure and the delicateness of like knowing when to, you know, lift back. And, and that's what makes it. So you can, how do you feel when, when you see it? How do you feel when you see a tattoo that's just like, uh, I get what you're doing here. Uh, sometimes I think, oh, like some people ask, like email and say, oh, can I get a tattoo? And I'm like, yeah, like. It's your fucking body, mate. <laughs> but then some people send me faith. I'm like, I wish you had kind of given me a heads up before. And I would have said, yeah, try this one. Maybe you should wait until you've saved enough money to get a decent artist to do it. Yeah, let's hope no, no one's um, going to recognise this. <laughs> what I was going to say, though, 
so you can edit all that bit out and go back to the textures and picking textures up. So for these works I'm doing along the South Bank, because coming from painting outside and then going more into canvas work, going that way around, there's such a, an ephemeral quality of the murals, which is, I think, why I'm drawn to it, because there's kind of less pressure. It's gonna, it's just part of the whole movement of life. Mm -hmm. But then I try and document in some way like what's happened in the process, but then taking prints from the outside and putting them into my canvas kind of records that. So this is what I've done with the the flags and banners that I've made. I've gone around and taken prints of the trees that are around the south bank that go around the perimeter and then stitched that in within so it's quite graphic, but then you've got these elements of... So when you say taking prints of the trees around the South Bank, what what does that actually entail? Tell me about that process. Just, we I, again, I take my big brushes and then... Um, so over, so you'll take... No, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, so you take a brush and then you do it over the tree? Nah, easier, you just tell me how you do it. You can either, either, I've done one... Or do you want to keep the secret? Well, I do two different versions. Either ink it up as if you are doing a like a like a lino or some like more traditional print version, or going over the top. Yeah. So, is this something that you think you're going to explore more of? I mean, I'm, I'm interested in this idea of of pulling out your own textures from fabrics. Is this informed by anything that you had seen before? You influenced, or is this just kind of just you wanting to develop your practice in a different way? Yeah. Um, it was when I was. It was Matt Watkins I was talking about earlier, and um, and we were in the desert and we'd taken canvas to go and paint out there. I was wondering what you were going to say there. We had taken, we were in the desert and we had taken. Usually, usually that can go any other direction. Oh, canvases, that's cute. <laughs> um, but it started there, just like experimenting. But there's in Birmingham, there was so much regeneration happening, mm. and. So I'd been commissioned to paint a mural in the New Art Gallery of Warsaw. It like I don't know, it just didn't fit right. Just going in and painting, it just didn't seem to have any real relation to the show. So I so I took the canvas out into these woods, and then took the imprints, and then took that back to the gallery, and then worked on it in there. And then they framed up. So there was three panels, nine meter by three meter each. So it became this huge canvas work. Which, you know, now, when I look back at these places, they're gone, completely gone. So it really does, when the murals have gone, they've got, they only stay in people's memory, but having that kind of permanence on the canvas is a nice, you know, balances well, it out. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, as an artist, you want your work to live, outlive you, right? Yeah. No? Well, yeah, I mean... Do you know, is that how we start? Well, maybe I'm putting w words into your mouth here then, because it sounds like I I would have thought, having spoken with a couple of people before, that there was an element of, and maybe it comes later, and I'm particularly thinking actually of Tracy Emin at the moment, who's going through this whole thing about her own morality, morality, mortality, um, with her work and kind of this idea of legacy, and maybe it's something that comes a little bit later. But she's really trying to sit and think, you know, she's been faced with this kind of, you know, the thing that's going to kill her. And, you know, that that's what you start to think about. And, and the art is a way of that kind of preservation. Is it? So it's never really been like that for you. Do you know, one of my strongest memories is seeing um, this blue and yellow, just said hip hop don't stop, graffitied in Birmingham. I will never forget that image. I mean, it lasted probably not that long. What was about that? Oh, well, I was about six or seven. They were my favourite colours for a start. And then it was this juxtaposition on this old, bombed-out church. It was like, who's done that? What's that? Why? What's that even mean? What's going on? What do you mean the hip-hop doesn't stop? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Like, six or seven, like, what is this? Or, but I like it. It looks fun. <laughs> do you think that was a, a an initial gateway for you? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I wonder if I hadn't seen that. No, I don't know because I used to like uh, draw all over the, the house and stuff, just secret little messages. 
thinking no one would see it. Go on. And then they did. Tell me about your secret little messages. Ah, no, of course they were stupid. You were young. Everything's stupid when you're young. What were you writing in the house? Was it like messages to someone else or messages to yourself? No, so I messages to myself, like where, like kind of like a treasure trail saying, okay, this is where things are and you have to follow it. And, or like, I think, yeah. You have a twin. I have a twin. Was she, is she as creatively in, inclined as yourself? Do you think you're quite similar in that, that way? And she's helped me on a few times and that's been like... You know, you just have to give a look and, you know, we're totally like, okay, paint that, yeah. No explaining, like, oh, can we know? Like, do you think, and we kind of talked about this the other day, do you think you have that that twin telepathy? I mean, when you suck with someone for so long, you've got, and you see, I mean, we see, we're really, we're really close. And so we do have a, yeah. There is kind of something. Have you ever sent her into an interview to do the talking? No, you know what? She has done a few things where she's, at the end of the day, like when we've been away working and I've been exhausted from painting all day and then in the evening with everyone, she kind of like, it's then... She's the placeholder. Yeah, the, <laughs> like the confident, chatty one here. Is, is Are you different in that sense? Uh, we kind of balance each other out. So if one's... You know, we kind of take it in turns without subconscious, you know, it's not a, like, okay, it's your turn. It's not quite like the parent trap where you're scheming and things like that. It's more, it's more just natural than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but she was the only one that could um, understand me with this speech impediment, so she'd have to translate to my parents and everything. For a lot of people listening, they won't understand what you're saying when you say speech impediment, because you sound, you know, you sound... You sound good. Normal. You sound coherent. Uh, normal. What do you mean to speech impediment? So I would miss off the initial and last consonant of every word. In my head, I could hear it fine, but what was coming out was illegible. At the moment, you sound very coherent. And so I'm trying very hard. But did it used to be worse or does it sometimes come back? Yeah, if I'm tired, then yeah. It was funny because the first time when we were talking about this the other day, the first time we actually met, the very first time we met, it was on a stage in uh, to do something for Monica Art Fair. It was the art conference. You were it was supposed to be a Q and A, and you were talking about your work. And just before you would kind of come on, you were like, "I'm absolutely fucking terrified of this, and I do not want to do it." I know. Normally, I'm kind of you know on one level and can jump into things or just just do it mm -hmm. that one I completely taught myself the other way around I was like this isn't happening and I was literally just about to walk away and then I thought it's like 15 minutes before I'm meant to be talking I should just do it and you got through it and it was good yeah only just so no, just, no you got through it with flying colours you passed the test it was great and we sat and we talked about uh, a lot of your work from back then and that was like I don't know like eight years ago six years ago something like that it was uh, yeah quite a while you think uh, much has changed in your sort of the way that you look at things since back then to, to now yeah uh, you know um, things have been put in perspective um, to uh, things that happen in life life flows that you and then you realise kind of what's important and what isn't. What's important for you now? Uh, health and family, I guess. It's the key thing. That's a solid one. And then it kind of comes... I get the, the other Fs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Family and health. Uh, I don't know what the F for health is. What is on the horizon for you? You've got this show with Hayward. What's in the... On in the reality and then maybe what's in the hopes and dreams for what you'd like in reality and hopes and dreams I guess it kind of there's a space um, back home that I'm going to use to do some kind of more explorative works um, working with Matt again don't want to say too much because it's that thing isn't it once you talk about it you've kind of put it out there no there's some like version where you feel like you've already done it a bit whereas when it's 
completely. You want to come in with the big guns and surprise everybody? No, I mean, I probably won't even show anyone. I never show anyone. I've kind of stepped off Instagram and I was thinking, it should be like, I just. What is your relationship with social media then? I don't really use it that much. No, I, that's what I mean. It's a, you know, it's a conscious, clearly a conscious decision for you. Do, did you have an unhealthy relationship with it? No, not at all. Um, it just doesn't hold me like I don't know I just feel I know I sh probably should because how else do people know what you're up to but then I don't want to just be constantly thinking okay I need to put that need to put that down need to that feels to me like a whole other mind and job to do and whereas I just want to focus here but the thing is for most Young artists, particularly, that's just the natural part of their yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's just like you are you're an artist, and that's it. You know, it doesn't exist unless you put it on Instagram. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in the days if someone held a camera in front of you, everyone would run and hide. Now you put a phone up, and everyone's like, "Oh, can I see? Can I take a picture of me? And can I see it?" Yeah. One of the things I've not asked you: you're the first person from Birmingham. I said that wrong, said that weird. I don't know why my accent, I don't know why my accent did that. You're the first person, you're the first person from Birmingham, you're the first person from Birmingham that we've had on, I'll get there eventually. Uh, what What was the street art, graffiti, public art scene like there and what is it that sort of, you know, you didn't succumb to the London thing? You were very much a Birmingham artist. I moved you're to not. London and I did, seven years there and then um, I went back to Birmingham for three months to do something and then ended up staying I mean it's it's so central and with a easy close airport and you've got countryside within like 30 minutes and the people are kind of down to earth and it's not all just I don't know it, it suits me like a bit more, and my twin sister in London, so I feel like I've got the best of both now. I can turn up without anything, and you know. Um, but the there was there's a lot of really. Um, so when I was young, the graffiti was more like purist, and a lot of the guys doing it were very open to you know encouraging everyone to come join it's only in recent years it's completely changed and now it's really visible which is a good thing but it's like absolutely like Digbeth is just full of there's some amazing work going up but before it was kind of hidden away you'd have to know where to go and does it feel like quite a open receptive city to the arts and culture then uh more now I don't want to publicly um you know but definitely uh, the council weren't exactly that supportive back then. Do you see like you know things like young galleries emerging and? Oh yeah, there's so loads of like, yeah, yeah, a lot of artist-led gallery spaces and yeah, definitely. I'm starting to notice. I don't know if it's because they're they're new and they're happening, or if I'm just, you know, I don't know if it's because they're new or because I'm just starting to notice. But I'm starting to see more and more art-led projects and businesses starting up outside of London. Yeah, what since do you think since um maybe since the pand maybe since the pandemic. I just mean in recent years, but yeah, okay, I guess covid is probably the the blanket for that. It, well, it's probably more due to the fact of finance like, you know, if you're young. But when I moved to London, I was paying like something like 20 quid a rent, 20 quid a week for rent where's now? 20 quid a week on rent. Well, see, you're old. You're not that old. Yeah, I mean, there was a few of us in the house, wow. but and it was in Stretton. <laughs> so many quick that we grab it. Yeah, it's it. That sounds absolutely like unfathomable. Yeah, yeah. Jesus, what was that place like? Yeah, cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> it was only at the end we got running water. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, that's probably why because. Yeah, I couldn't imagine trying to move to London now as a, like, I think I was 19, 20 at that point. 
thing. Yeah. Like, I, I still follow the on, on Facebook, just the sharing page where everyone's like looking for spaces. I find it interesting for some reason. It's like you now you've got guys, you know, twenty years old coming in, going, "Hey, I'm moving to London. Budget is nine hundred to a thousand a month, looking for a shared space." And you're like, "What? Well, twenty one year old has a thousand pounds a month to spend on rent? Get the fuck out of here!" Like, what are you doing? You, you're a student. Shut up. Like, it's so inaccessible for people that are coming from different backgrounds. Like, I was, I mean, I was paying £350 a month for my shoebox in Brick Lane. And I thought that was cheap until I heard about your 20 quid a week. <laughs> you trumped me on that one. <laughs> but that was manageable, right? Like, I could, you know, I could, I could work in a bar at the weekend or, you know, do a couple of little bits. Yeah, and actually get by and have some time to I'd be fine and that gave me the time to to you know to mince about but just coming in now and being cr- crippled by you know a thousand pound a month on overheads before you've even got going it's like how do you how do you nurture something creative when all your energy has been put into that and I think the the, the problem with all that is that actually the people that do get access to do the creative things are all coming from money anyway because they're the ones that can who have parents that can afford a thousand pounds a month so that little you know Hugo and Tulula can go off and get their, you know, unpaid internship at media companies. Um, I'm not too sure how we got there, but I've just taken a big swipe at the middle classes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have to apologise to the Tallulahs and Hugo. Sorry, Hugo. Sorry, Tallulah. Don't know why I felt it necessary to have a pop at you. But there we are. Anything else you'd like to say? No, I think we should leave it. <laughs> well, see, I know this was probably your least favourite thing in the world to do. But I do appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk with us. And again, thank you so much for coming to Kosovo. Yeah, well, thank you for inviting us.